And uh, with that, we have uh, Darren Rudnick. Uh, oh, Darren, I'm not introducing people. I'm letting you guys do your introduction. Uh, you know yourselves better and you could be more to point. So with that, um, you should have capability to share your screen. All right. Perfect. Thank you, Brian. Let's see. All right. Well, my name is Darren Rudnick. I'm an irrigation management specialist at the University of Nebraska. It's real, it's a pleasure to be here. And I'm going to present on what we've learned about irrigation scheduling tools. And I'll talk a little bit about the technology uh, that we've kind of administered through the, the TAPS program that both myself, Jason, and a large group of faculty and industry are working on. Uh, definitely happy to answer any questions at the end of this and my contact information's here if you want to reach out later and we can have a conversation. Uh, before I get started, I do want to acknowledge uh, the TAPS program is it's rather large and we've been very fortunate to have a, a really great group of people involved and a lot of support. And so we just want to acknowledge some of the commodity boards, um, USDA and um, a lot of the industry partners. So the outline of my talk, I want to really start by discussing how we evaluate good management, uh, specific to irrigation and nitrogen, but focusing on irrigation. Uh, then I want to talk a little bit about the technologies available to manage irrigation. And I want to dive into how an ET-based irrigation scheduling tool works, give a few examples of uh, soil water sensors, and maybe when you're looking at it, if you can pick out things that are looking promising versus those that look a little um, concerning. And then lastly, I wanna do an example of really how to evaluate uh, the uh, payoff for irrigation technology. So this is uh, kind of a long list of different efficiency terms that we really can use to assess irrigation and nitrogen management. I feel like in academia, and I'm guilty myself, but we, we tend to think of good management about efficiency, right? So the person that got the highest irrigation efficiency or irrigation water use efficiency must be a better manager than the person that had the lower one. And I would say that's misleading. And I'm gonna show an example using the TAPS data on why that is. And we have to start to think beyond efficiency and really get to the root of assessing how we manage and then how we guide our growers. Um, and so when I said that, there's still value in efficiency terms. And so some of the benefits that we can find is really comparing regions, if we wanna parameterize crop models, if we wanna compare application methods, um, irrigation systems. So for example, say right there in Guyman, if we have an SDI system and a center pivot, the soils are the same. If I gave you six inches of water, it'd be very telling on the performance by simply using maybe an irrigation uh, water use efficiency or crop water use efficiency um, comparison. Uh, same thing if we're looking at uh, nitrogen application methods or fungicide versus no fungicide. But the challenge that we have is a lot of these efficiency terms have a yield component in there. And what we'll find is that they don't maximize at an optimum, but rather they tend to decrease as we add more inputs. And so here is the data from, I think, the 2018 uh, TAPS program in North Platte, Nebraska. And we can see that the person that put on one inch had a 80 bushel per acre inch irrigation water use efficiency. Uh, whereas the person that put on the most irrigation of close to 12 inches, uh, they were right at, um, at about 10. Now, when we look at this, we, we can definitely say that the one was more efficient, but the reality is there was a 50 bushel per acre difference. And if we translate that into profit, uh, there was what, nearly a $40 difference. And so simply being efficient for efficient sake is is not really a good metric of good management. Um, now, granted, there's probably somewhere in that, you know, maybe six to nine range that would have been the more uh, profitable as well as uh, reasonable in terms of efficiency. The other thing we need to be thinking about is the fact that a lot of these efficient, uh, efficiency terms have grain yield in it. And so they are sensitive to cultivar selection. Um, obviously, if we plant, we would all be planting the same seed if we would expect them all to respond the same. And I think this audience understands that very well. And so when we start looking at efficiency terms, we definitely can see that some hybrids, whether it's due to the environment, your input uh, management practices, they might respond more favorably or um, on the other side, uh, underperform. And so I'm gonna go ahead and kind of illustrate that and really 
drive that point home in this example. And I wanna pick on two farms from our 2017 competition. Uh, one of them was using a Dynagro hybrid and the other one was using, I believe, a channel. If we isolate those two farms uh, and kind of showing the differences in their management practices in the TAPS program, really the only thing that really separated them was their hybrid selection. And so this graph is showing date on the x-axis and cumulative irrigation plus rainfall on the y-axis. And then that black dotted line that's going across the screen, that is fully irrigated ET. And so this is actually measured using more sophisticated equipment, but that's really what the climate is asking uh, the crop to supply for water. And we can see really between these two farms, really hard to separate in terms of uh, the irrigation scheduling. We also diving into it, we found that the nitrogen, they both put on 165 pounds. They both did split applications, which is uh, typically our recommended practice. And so when we look at the two, we really see that it's uh, differences in hybrid. And I'm not trying to show this to talk about one being better than the other, but the reality is that in this case, one of the hybrids outperformed the other by 15 bushels per acre. And so if we look at that in terms of efficiency, we're gonna go ahead and see that the farm six underperformed farm 10, but really evaluating them, I would say that they both were excellent managers of irrigation and nitrogen. And so what we need to be thinking about is what tools and technology do we have available so that we can provide that at least optimum range of irrigation, nitrogen, and some of the other inputs. Uh, and so in this case, using some of the 2017 data, uh, Dr. Lowe and I, we uh, put this together where we're talking about, you know, being able to use maybe an ET based model to really assess that upper range and then use more of a 80% of that ET model for a lower range. And if your growers are falling in that band, uh, there's a good chance that they're um, not necessarily, they're not going to be sacrificing yield or over applying irrigation. And then this graph I want to show, this is pulling our TAPS data from 2017 through 2019. And what we can see is the efficiency on the x-axis and I have hypothetical net income on the y-axis. And what I mean by that is basically if we strip marketing and assume everybody marketed the same way each year, uh, we see that as we become more efficient, we lend ourselves to be more economical. Uh, that's kind of a, a, a no-brainer, right? We would expect that if you, you don't wanna put on more inputs to sacrifice yield, but you also don't want to under apply where you're sacrificing yield in that regard. So um, what we're trying to get here is some people, when we think of efficiency, we, we think that we have to sacrifice yield and we have to sacrifice profit, but they tend to go hand in hand. So we need to find those tools and management strategies to uh, be efficient, uh, which will hopefully translate into income. So let's go ahead and dive into irrigation technology. Uh, this is obviously very small in your graph, but it is a screenshot of the old checkbook method for irrigation. And that has written, I don't know, 40 years ago, 50 years ago, but it's been around for decades. Uh, the reason I like to show this is that publication is relevant today as it was back 50 years ago. The only difference is we have a lot more technology and resources at our fingertips to do a better job and a faster job at filling in those blanks. So we have soil water monitoring devices. We have uh, a better handle of the soil variability in our fields. Uh, we have uh, models and better assessment of our crop growth and the sensitivity to water stress. Uh, we understand our uh, topography and uh, where water is actually going to accumulate versus run off. We have access to weather data, uh, whether that is buying something that's an edge of field weather station or if we connect to a public uh, network. We have the ability to manage and instrument our system so we know how it's performing. If there's issues, we can turn it on and off. Um, now we have sensors out there uh, that we can go ahead and look at canopy performance, um, or we can look at the uh, shrinking and swelling of the stocks. And we also have a, a suite of imagery products that really can give us a better sense of if stress is developing in the field. And so, to kind of dive in, I'm, I'm gonna transition into talking a little bit about how an ET model works, but this graph really illustrates both an ET model as well as soil water sensors. And if we think of a soil as kind of a bucket, there's that top portion, that saturation field capacity where we tend to say that water freely drains. And so we say that upper limit of what the plants have available is that field capacity. 
And then on the uh, bottom side is our wilting point where we would say that this water is not available to the crop. And so in between those two points, we refer it to as available water. So now how we use an ET model or soil water sensors would be defining some threshold in which we would start to expect yield to be impacted. And when we run the ET model, we're really doing a water balance and we wanna make sure that we stay above that threshold. When we get close, we trigger our irrigation. There are a number of models out there. There are specific models to different states and there's some models that work across states. I believe uh, CanSCED uh, was developed where it's not really specific to just Kansas. And so I think that has been used down in Oklahoma and I'm sure Jason and Summit have a better handle of some of the tools that are relevant for your region. Uh, but kind of diving into how these work and uh, kind of the value of using these models because they really do handle a lot of these uh, internal processes. And so first kind of looking at this uh, checkbook method, defining effective rainfall, right? So total rainfall is super easy to get anymore. Uh, we can again, put a edge of field weather station. We can have a, a simple manual rain gauge. We can look at uh, more of the uh, networks of public stations, but now we have to start to think of what is effective. So how much of that rain actually made itself, made it into the soil profile. And so we have to start to estimate runoff. We have to estimate depercolation. So how much actually percolated through that uh, profile. Uh, this definitely becomes more relevant when we're dealing with sands. We also need to think about how much of that water was intercepted and uh, basically caught in that canopy and evaporated off. We need to think about the same process when we talk about irrigation. Uh, we know how much water we pump, but how much of that water is actually net. So how much got into the soil profile and was able to be made used uh, or made of use by the plant. And so we have to be talking about application efficiency. And here's some general uh, application efficiencies for different irrigation systems. We need to think about the crop water use in the form of evapotranspiration. A lot of these ET models and irrigation scheduling tools use a two-step approach where they use published crop coefficient values. Uh, these are values that were published by the High Plains Regional Climate Center uh, for different crops and you can see that they actually associate it to different growth stages and we take those crop coefficients and we can relate them to a reference ET um, and again that can be generated using weather station data whether it is edge of field public or even a, uh, an atmometer or an ET gauge. Uh, a couple considerations that we have to think about is distance from the location and being mindful of what reference surface we are working with. The next, uh, depending on our crop, we have to be thinking of that active root zone. So what depth are we associating for uh, really doing our water balance? So we know that as our crops start to develop, we're going to get deeper and deeper into that profile. And so here is just some work that we did in Nebraska, looking at different root development uh, and really the emphasis area for corn, um, going from starting at about 12 inches, going down to about 48 inches. And we have to take all that information and then we can do our water balance. And the nice thing is again, those tools, they do all those processes for us. There has been some concern about the, the quality of these models. Uh, we've done quite a bit of work in Nebraska and just kind of showing some of the data from 2018. Uh, so this is looking at our Pioneer 1197. And we had a series of rain fed all the way to excessive irrigation. And we wanted to compare our soil water based uh, management to our ET based tool. And really between those two uh, very similar yields, the ET model put on just a little bit more irrigation, uh, had a slightly higher yield, uh, but in terms of significant differences, uh, there were none. Now, in addition to ET models, we do have a suite of other tools and technology available. So we have soil water monitoring devices, canopy temperature, uh, we have dendrometry that has grown uh, in terms of interest, and we also have remote sensing products. I'm going to focus more on the soil water sensors, but I, I do want to go ahead and share a little bit about the dendrometry um, because I do know that that's growing, of, growing in interest. So this first graph, I believe, is, uh, yeah, 2018, our, our TAPS competition in North Platte, and we can see, I think it's a little bit more intuitive, right? So we expect the water content to drop. When we irrigate, we see a response. It goes up, and really, it 
we need to define where that threshold to stay above so we don't stress that plant. Now, in terms of dendrometry, really what it's doing is looking at the shrinking and swelling of a plant, and it's relating that maximum daily shrinkage to water stress, right? And there's some algorithms that they have uh, in, uh, embedded in their system where they basically remove the growth um, versus the daily shrinkage, but they take that information and they relate that to stress. And in general, what we can see is as we irrigate, we will alleviate that stress. And so it's acting very similar. It's just a different way to be looking at uh, water stress and how we manage it. So a couple examples using data from our TAPS program. So here I wanna emphasize an over and under and an optimum irrigation practice um, by some of the growers and then what that looked like for our soil water monitoring devices. So same graph as what I shared be, uh, before, our x-axis, we have dates, uh, we have the fully irrigated evapotranspiration in the dashed line um, black, and then we have the cumulative rainfall in red. If I add rainfall plus the irrigation for these three farms, uh, we can basically start to compare how it, it matched to our ET. So farm number one, and I'm gonna show you um, that that one was a water stressed. So it definitely, at the tail end of the season, we stressed that crop. Farm number 10 was the most efficient producer in our competition. And so I would say for the most part, they had uh, almost perfect management or nearly as perfect as one can get. And then farm 15 really over irrigated and lended themselves to having issues of runoff and percolation losses. So if we go ahead and use um, or look at the data from AquaSpy, so these are sensors that they had access to to make those decisions as part of the competition. So we have farm one at the top, farm 10, which is the one that won highest efficiency and farm 15 who over irrigated. And so let's go ahead and start piecing out uh, these trends. So first at the beginning, for the most part, all three did an excellent job managing. Uh, we can see that farm 10 was the, uh, the highest efficient. It almost looked like they over irrigated at the beginning. And really that was not an artifact of their management. It was really just an artifact of how that sensor was responding. And uh, I can dive into that later if there are any questions. Um, next, we can see that during a really rainy period, um, all three responded nicely to that. Um, and so we can see that that buildup in that soil water in that uh, August period. But now that farm number one, it was very clear and it translated into yield that stress at the end of the season that we experienced, as well as maybe a little bit of stress that developed at the uh, late part of uh, July, which really would have been close to our more sensitive time period. Uh, farm number 10 did an excellent job of actually drawing down that profile, uh, utilizing all that water that we can um, actually pull from that soil. And then when we get these uh, late season recharge events, uh, you can see it basically refilled that profile in, in October and uh, late September. Whereas farm 15 really sustained uh, irrigation through that last part it never really shut off. And so when we start thinking of that diminishing response to yield, we probably weren't getting this, the value uh, as compared to the cost of that irrigation water at the end. And then what we ended up doing is putting us in a situation where if we have that off season recharge, some of that is going to percolate. And so um, just a couple examples of how we can start to look at that data and make sense of what is good management and maybe areas for improvement. Now that is Nebraska. Uh, one thing I've learned working with Jason, Oklahoma is a, a completely completely different beast. And so here's some data that Jason shared with me. Uh, this is the 2019 OSU TAPS competition. Here's farm number one. I believe they were uh, the uh, most profitable and I think, or at least the highest yielding farm. Uh, they put on 17 inches of water. You can see really they stayed within that recommended band by the company. Um, when it got close, they irrigated. They had very fast drawdowns, uh, primarily due to the evaporative demand of, of the area. And then let's look at now farm number four, who put on a couple inches uh, less. What really happened to farm number four, and Jason can really talk about it, is the fact is that they got behind at the beginning and they put themselves into a very stressed period, really at the time you don't want to be stressed. And that really translated into low yield. And you can see from 207 to 87 bushels per acre difference. And so using uh, some of this uh, technology, we wanna avoid, especially in a capacity issue, so that we don't run into um, stress conditions. 
So for the last five minutes, what I want to do is really talk about how technology can pay for itself. Um, by far, I get probably the two most common questions I get. One is, what is your recommendation for technology? And the second is, uh, do I see this technology paying for itself? And so here, really, there's a lot of ways to assess economic value. I'm not an ag economist, uh, but working closely with one, we can look at reduction in pumping and wear and tear on a system. Uh, we can obviously, if we do a good job of managing irrigation, we can increase grain yield. Uh, we can reduce labor and travel costs, especially with some of the telemetry products that we have. Um, so maybe prioritizing which fields we go and observe to see if there are any conditions that uh, warrant um, our uh, uh, being there on site. Uh, we have a peace of mind, and then we also can reduce uh, the total irrigation withdrawal. So here, uh, I'm going to spe specifically talk about if we simply were looking at reducing irrigation withdrawal, can that cover the cost of a sensor? And so this table is uh, data that was generated by Daryl Martin, and it's the Nebraska Pumping Plant Performance Criteria. And it really is saying is if you're operating at 100% of that criteria, how much, um, uh, how many gallons of diesel are required to pump a unit uh, or an acre inch of water um, for different lifts, right? So say we had 40 pounds per square inch um, discharge pressure. If we were pumping from 150 feet, it would be 2.21 gallons of diesel uh, to pump that one acre inch uh, of water. Uh, there's different multipliers if we're operating less than that 100% of the performance criteria. And then we have some conversions if you're not using diesel, but if you're using electricity, propane, or gasoline. Uh, now I'm going to go ahead and use Eastern Colorado as an example. So this is some work done by Joel Schneekloth and Alan Andalis uh, that look at consumptive use across Eastern Colorado. And I'm going to pick on Ray, Colorado for grain corn. And so they're saying consumptive use, so how much water is actually lost in the form of evapotranspiration, and they have it as 24.5 inches for the season, and then they have effective rainfall, the long-term average being about 7.2 inches. And so let's look at an irrigation system in eastern Colorado. Uh, it's a center pivot. We're going to assume the lift is 150 feet, pressure is 40 pounds per square inch, energy is diesel, and we're operating at 100% of the Nebraska pumping plant performance criteria. Uh, we're on a sandy loam soil, uh, field size 130 acres, and our energy cost of $2.75 per gallon. And so first, energy to pump an acre inch, uh, kind of just pulling it from that table, it, that would be 2.21 gallons per acre inch. Uh, the cost then to apply an acre inch of water, if we go ahead and multiply that by the cost of diesel, we're looking at a little over $6 per acre inch. If we multiply that by our field size, we're looking at basically nearly $800 per revolution to put on one acre in, or one inch of water. Next, uh, oftentimes we might have systems that don't operate at 100% of that criteria. And so the less efficient that system is, the more expensive it is to apply that one inch of water. And so basically if we're operating at say 70%, we get our multiplier and we're looking at now over $1,100 per inch to apply it to that, uh, that field. So now say we had a, a sensor that a company is recommending, or um, say you have a client that's interested in some of this technology and they're looking at about a $2,000 price tag. So really if we're simply looking at irrigation withdrawal to cover that $2,000, we can go ahead and divide that by the cost per revolution. And we're needing to save about 1.8 inches of uh, water withdrawal. And so basically taking the money that we would have paid to pump that water and using it to pay for that irrigation. So then the next step on really how to evaluate this would be um, looking at that consumptive use of that crop. So now we're over here. Um, this is not Hastings, Nebraska. I think we're looking at Akron or no, not Akron, but uh, I can't remember where we are right uh, just east of Yuma. Uh, but our consumptive use of, oh, Ray, Colorado, I apologize. Uh, consumptive use, 24.5 inches. Effective rain, long-term, 7.2 inches. And so we said that we're on a sandy loam soil, which we have 0.7 inches per foot. If we say that the root zone is four feet, we have 2.8 inches of available water. And so our net irrigation requirements, we can take the consumptive use minus the effective rainfall 
minus our available soil water. And we're looking at a net irrigation requirement of 14 and a half inches. And so here, our gross irrigation, if we assume the center pivot um, and their application efficiency to be about 75 to 85%, we would need to have a gross irrigation requirement of 17 to 19.3 inches for the long-term average. So if we were working with a producer and you're uh, saying that their long-term average in this area and they're applying 23 inches per season, really we can take that 23 minus our 19 or 17. And if we did perfect management, we might be able to go ahead and increase or decrease 3.7 to six inches of applied irrigation. And so if the cost was 1.8 inches to pay for that $2,000 sensor, there's actually enough room there that it might be possible to reduce irrigation withdrawal to cover that technology expense. Now, the next thing is if they are applying closer to 17 inches, then really the answer is no. Um, on the long-term average, paying for that technology by reducing irrigation withdrawal is probably unlikely. Now, if you look at it in terms of the increase in yield, it would be looking at about four bushels per acre. And so one thing that we need to be thinking about is local conditions as well as other value that that technology can bring. And with that, I believe I'm over in time. So I do appreciate it. And I'll entertain any questions maybe at the end of the session. We've got time for a question or two uh, for Darren as uh, Jason's bringing up his, his slide set. Let me make sure I haven't got anything in my... Um, how much yield would a farm lose, farmer lose if he took the sprinkler heads off by the tires to keep from making ruts? Yeah, that's a good question. So it completely depends on the sprinkler um, that you have and how much reduction. Uh, one thing that we do in Nebraska uh, and some of the issues that we have, we actually put on 180s on our sprinklers. And so we really aren't losing any yield. So basically those 180s will nozzle it down so it's putting on half the amount of water because it's only irrigating half the area. And so I would probably recommend that. Um, if you do take that off, we basically would need to look at the total area impacted because we know that potentially portions of that area are gonna be deficit irrigated from an outer sprinkler. Um, so it's hard to answer uh, straightforward, but uh, there are ways that we can go about it or we can even use boom backs to get away from it as well. All right.